We're going to give a few minutes for people to come in, then we're going to begin. Okay. Or just a minute. So welcome to On the Park Bench, a public square conversation brought to you by the Congress for the New Urbanism. On the Park Bench presents interactive conversations with thought leaders in new urbanism and their allies, providing an opportunity for the audience to engage in real time. The webinar series is a platform for CNU members to engage, debate, and collaborate on the pressing issues we're facing right now. Let us know if you'd like to hear from some, someone or about something and we'll try to line it up. Uh, today we have an author's forum which is a series within the On the Park Bench series and it's discussing recently published books by urbanists and or books of interest to urbanists. The author's forum is produced by Dura Tadani who usually works behind the scenes to put these together but today he's going to be part of the program. So today's author's forum is Life Between Buildings and Cities for People by author Jan Gale and a discussion with Dira Tadani. So share your thoughts on On the Park Bench, hashtag On the Park Bench, www.tinyurl.com slash otpbfeedback and register for our next webinar, which is next week, Tuesday, May 11th, also at 12 noon, Design for Social Change, last in a series highlighting the three critical session tracks at CNU 29, Design for Change. This episode of On the Park Bench will ask new urbanist thought leaders why we must design for social change. CNU 29 sessions in the social track will examine how design has the power to change the way our communities function from investigating who has access to resources to ensuring all voices have the opportunity to shape the future. CNU.org slash resources slash on the park bench to register. And I wanted to remind everybody about CNU 29, Design for Change, the 29th Congress for the New Urbanism, which is taking place this month. May 19th through 21st. There will also be some pre-Congress sessions earlier in the week, and we're going to focus on the intersection of design and power, the power design holds to influence the way we live, to physically change and adapt the spaces we inhabit, as well as how we can use it to achieve the change we want to see in neighborhoods, towns, cities, and across regions. The CNU 29 program <laughs> will break the mold of previous Congresses with multiple formats that maximize the benefits of being held virtually and encourage creativity and innovation from participants. Learn more at cnu.org slash cnu29. This episode of On the Park Bench is going to be really special. It features Jan Gale, a Danish architect whose impact on cities and urbanism over the last 50 years cannot be overstated. A measure of that influence is that Jan Gale is only one of 13 people to win a CNU Athena medal, which honors urbanists whose work has influenced the founders of CNU and who set the foundation for the new urbanism movement. Jan Gale was also a plenary speaker at two CNUs, a CNU 13 in Pasadena in 2005 and CNU 26 in Savannah, Georgia in 2018. There are only a few people who have attended CNU as plenary speakers only, and it is a big deal when they come, and Jan Gale is among that select few. He is a founding partner of Gale Architects based in Copenhagen and working all over the world. And as I mentioned, Dura Tadani, an architect and urbanist uh, based in Washington, DC, is an interviewer today. And, and uh, he is a winner of seven charter awards, which is quite amazing. That's right up there with other top new urbanists. He is also an author, including two major books, 
on Seaside. The newest one is just out, Reflections of Seaside, Muses, Ideas, Influences, New and Future Projects. That book includes 140 essays um, on Seaside, including one by yours truly, covering how it has influenced the lives and work of urbanists. There are a few books who have had the enduring impact on urbanism of Life Between Buildings, which was first published in 1971. And so this year marks the 50th anniversary of its publication. It is one of those books that are never out of print and has been published in, in, and translated in uh, 37 languages. Uh, and it's being translated into more uh, languages as we speak. Jan Gale is the author of 17 books, uh, but the other book he is most known for, at least um, in the United States, is Cities for People, published in 2010, in many ways a follow-up book to Life Between Buildings 40 years later. You'll be hearing more about both of these books in this uh, episode of On the Park Bench today. This webinar, this webinar will feature a presentation by Jan Gale and then a discussion uh, with Dura Tadani. And then we're gonna open this up to questions from the audience. Uh, so please use the Q&A function of Zoom, not the chat function, although you can uh, make comments in the chat function, ask the questions in the Q&A function as they occur to you because they will more than likely be asked uh, in the order that they're, uh, that they're posted. And with that, I'm going to turn the screen over uh, to Jan Gale, if I can stop sharing. And welcome, Jan. And I will start by saying, by thanking you for the invitation. I love very much sitting on park, park benches. I advocate for cities to put up more benches for 50 years now. And sitting on one in Washington, D.C. and in the U.S. is a great pleasure for me and in this good company. Thank you for inviting me. I will now show a few slides. Few may not be quite the word, but show some slides to tell you a little bit about the book we are going to talk about, how it came about and what came after it. And I'm going to share my screen. There we are. Does it work for you? Yes, it does. Excellent. I'm going to tell you a little bit about this book, Life Between Buildings, and the background for, what, for how it was necessary to write it and lo and behold, I realize it's now 50 years ago, the first version of this little book was published in Denmark and in Danish in 1971. I'll tell you the story. I'll tell you very briefly about the story of my life. I graduated as an architect in 1960. That is 61 years ago. I was taught in architecture in the 50s. And what were, the, the, what were we taught about? We were taught about modernism. We were taught about from guys like this one who said that uh, a good housing area is something with looks smashing from the freeway. And we were taught that to make a good city, we had to go up in circa five kilometer airline height over the site and then place down the elements until there was a nice composition of elements and then we will step back and say oh that is a nice city here you can see the guy and here you can see one of his presumably nice cities i got this in this education and and also in this time, we always, in the School of Architecture, literally, we bowed three days, three times a day towards Brasilia, which at that time was a big thing in city planning. And looking back at this period, I see it now as the all time low point of city planning. But I stepped out 
of, of university to do all these fantastic modernistic things. And then you think that I read Jane Jacobs. I met Jane Jacobs, her, read, read, uh, her writing. Uh, no, that was not what I did. We didn't know about Jane Jacobs over there in Denmark in 1960. What I was doing was doing social housing in Greenland. And here are the results. And coming back 50 years later, they were full speeds taking it down again. It has served its time. No, I didn't meet Jane Jacobs, but I met Ingrid, my wife. We married in 1961 and she was a psychologist. And I was an architect, just an ordinary architect, run of the mill, good modernist. Then I married a psychologist and suddenly the whole climate in the house changed. She had her friends and I had my friends. We met all of us and all the time we architects had an awful time with the social scientists and they kept saying, why are you architects not interested in people? Why don't they teach you anything about people in the schools of architecture? And why is it that your professors go out four o'clock in the morning and take photos of the monuments to be sure there are no disturbing people in the foreground? Here I have a little ensemble of pictures of the time when we were married, 1960, early. And what is this about? Go oh, just now they have a little exhibition, actually not a little one, but they have a grand exhibition in the Danish Architecture Center about architects at work. And they have allocated a nice part of the, of the exhibition to show the story of my life. And in the background, you can see all my books lined up in a book sh bookshelf. I'll tell you about the background because I was sitting there with my wife and I was doing my, my ordinary architect's work and we were looking out at the world around us. And that was the time, and I say 1960 is really a turning point when it started to go really fast and where the cars were streaming into our societies way back. This is from around the turn of the previous century you can see that's Copenhagen. It's a very peaceful scene. People are walking in all directions. It's uh, they belong. The city belongs to the people, and you can walk wherever you like. And there are no, uh, there there are not this forest of signs which we have today, which is part of the automobile. But this was a peaceful scene, just in before the war sometime. We had the uh, automobile arrived in, in, in bigger numbers and people had to run for their lives and get their children safe up to the sidewalks, whatever. But actually, we saw this invasion of motor cars, which actually pushed life out of the existing cities. This is a picture from Copenhagen uh, in the 50s. All the squares were full of parking and all the streets were completely full of cars and people, the life of the city was pushed away at that time. That was what we saw looking out of our windows. And we saw the results of modernism. We saw the results of Corbusier saying, city is bad, freestanding building is good. We saw the lifeless surrounding with all the concrete blocks for housing being put up. In Denmark, we had these enormous areas in the 60s where maybe 10,000 people were moved into. It was not social housing, it was non-profit housing, um, but it was purely modernistic um, where you can sleep and look out of the window but can't do much other things. We had, I, we had the, the world was looking like that in the suburbs at that time really boring, really unfriendly, completely uninviting for people. That was what we saw. And then, of course, we started to discuss it. And also later on, I, st I studied it more carefully and realized what happened with the modernism. 
Before modernism, the cities were const cons uh, were they they um, were made up by spaces. City was space, and in the spaces, all the life of the city was unfolding. That was the connection. That was a market. That was processions. Everything in spaces. The only thing which, when you think about the old cities. You can remember all the streets and squares and two buildings, the cathedral and the town hall, and no more because all the other ones was just framing the spaces where life was going on. City was space. With the modernist came a completely new concept. The focus was moved from the spaces to the objects and whatever was not built upon was leftover space. And also, instead of making uh, spaces and buildings around, we started to have no situation because objects, buildings, you can order on the web. And we had this new generation of architects, the birch sheet architects who goes around and drop their droppings whenever they can find it without context, just dropping objects it was. What happened with the modernism was that again, the people were chased out of the environment because these areas were not made at all for people. It was meant for sleeping at night, but not, no concern for public space and people. The one to the right is from Brasilia, endless walking strips here, not inviting. Also with modernism, we lost our sense of human scale and we got utterly confused about what was a good scale. In the old days, the scale was everything in the new uh, world of modernism. Buildings, objects were put everywhere and whatever was left over was left for people. And in what scale it was, was not a big problem. Generally, it was too big. I was sitting there doing other things uh, in, a, in an ordinary office. And then we had the very interesting uh, incident that I came a man to the office. He was a Christian man and he approached my boss and said, I'm a Christian man. I have a piece of land. I want to build something which is good for people. I don't want to build single family houses. I don't want to be urban blocks or blocks, modernistic blocks. No, I want something which is good for people. In the first instance, we of course said, whenever, whatever the architects do, that's good for people. And he said, no, 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 it should be really good for people. You must study this. And we then we panicked what was good for people. What could, then it appeared that my boss has been in Italy and seen some little villages with a square where the buildings are around and that looks quite nice. So this project ended with, um, that we define that good for people is that you have your house, but also you have your shared space, your public space where you can meet and do things together. So we formed this around 11 little um, squares. It was so progressive at that time that it was never built. Everybody said it will never work. People will not like to live so close. And, and 10 years later, actually, this was the way which where everything was built this way, but this particular project was not. But that was the first time when I was met by this good for people. And of course, we discussed it very much in the household. And we actually, through Ingrid, I got hold of a sociologist who thought he knew something. It appeared that he didn't know anything after all, but he mentioned the figure 15. And then we put 15 houses around the yard, that was it. But we realized, my wife and I, that we knew virtually nothing about what was good for people and how the built environment influenced people. This resulted in two things. One, my wife was employed right away by the Danish Building Research Institute as an environmental psychologist. At that time, they didn't know that there were something like that an environmental psychologist. That whole issue came later. She was just a psychologist. 
hired to look into housing. And I had to go back to school of architecture to study 40 more years to hear what they didn't tell me first time I was in school of architecture. And then I realized that they didn't knew a thing about what was good for people. They didn't knew anything about people. It was completely working land. So in my case, I had to sit on my behind and he actually I've sat there for 40, 60 years now and studied and studied and observed using architecture methods of work, which is observation, systematic data collection, putting things into systems and order and see the patterns. That's what I learned in School of Architecture and that's what I learned. I studied restoration and old buildings very much and learned to measure and then I measured colonial housing, I measured old churches, I measured ruin in Greece, but then for the next 40, 50 years, I just measured people and we had to find out methods for measuring life. But that was the background for the next thing we did, Ingrid and I, we, we went to Italy on a scholarship uh, with the purpose of finding out what the Italians used their squares for. And that was where all the basics were actually collected. Where would you stand in a space? Where would you talk with people? Where would you, how would you use the furniture in a city? How would you use the walls? We found the edge effect that people prefer to stand in the edge very much so. Of course, in this study in the, in the School of Architecture, second time I was there, that was where I came across Jane Jacobs and with great joy um, studied her books. And later on, I also met her and we had throughout the later part of her life, we have a very nice conversation and very nice correspondence. My work was very much along the line, but I was an architect, so I could go more into what could this mean for the way we are building our cities and our residential areas. All this ended, this first phase of studying, ended in 1961 by my wife publishing a book called The Living Environment about the psychological aspects of housing. That was really some, a really a, a, a breakthrough of a completely new way of looking at housing in relation to human needs. And I published at the same time from the Royal Academy of Arts, I published this first Danish version of life between buildings, actually where we started to tell what the space between the buildings were used for and how important the life between the buildings be life outside your dwellings were for community and society and for your own well-being. We had in Denmark a fantastic, valuable discussion in these years. It's called the Great Danish Debate on Living Environments. I, I, there's a few letters missing there, it doesn't matter. And the, the cartoon shows the architects discussing vividly whether you should pull high rise or row houses while all the Danes are thinking about a little single family house. And, but the outcome of all this was actually that the row house, the cluster housing and the more shared organization of the, build, uh, the housing areas was actually quite a bit of benefit. The Building Research Institute put full speed on this to try to turn the Danish into thinking to build, we call it dense low, it's something like cluster housing, and, and there, this is their New Year's greeting of 1971. For many years, we've lived spread out or lived stacked up, but we may also live closer together. And they went on to elaborate dense low and an old residential concept for people in community, but yet a new one. And they ended up by wishing you a dense and low and therefore happy new year. It was really a discussion which was very strong in our country at that time. 
England's work in building research institute was part of this task force for dense law. I was sitting in another place in Copenhagen. I was sitting in the university in the School of Architecture, and we started with working in real life with life between buildings. We started to study how the life in Copenhagen was unfolding in the various spaces. And Copenhagen, for this close collaboration between university and city, became the first city in the world where the life in the city was documented just as carefully as had been all the time the traffic in the city. And we have this saying, of course, what you count, you care for. In Copenhagen, very early on, we counted the people and we started to care for the people. And they've gone on with this people first policy ever since in Copenhagen. And it had very much to do with the university because there was a strong collaboration between the researchers in the School of Architecture and the mayor and the city planners in the city. Denmark is a small place, we all know each other. Then came the English translation of this little book, and that came already 16 years after it was first published. I always thought it was funny that there should be 16 years in between, but I realized that at that point, we were well ahead of the other parts of the world in this social approach this understanding on life and people in relation to housing and to, um, and to uh, city environments. But in 87, it came out first time in New York. It didn't sell very well. They didn't market it much. And, uh, but that was the start of it being spread out. We can, I can also now look back at life between buildings in, in 50 years and see how the cover has changed. First, it was a protest book. It was the hippies coming out and making a big party to show that people had a right for the public space. Then it became more a celebration of the good old days. It was back to the village where you could meet on the village street. But then in say, say 80s, we started to be more and more interested in urban, in the urban situation after flirtation with the suburbs. Everybody was flirting with the suburbs in the 70s and 80s, but by the late 80s and the 90s, we started to flirt with the city. The attention was turning back to the city and the cover reflected this new interest. And later on, when the book became more and more international, the cover became more and more sort of general, some people floating around in the environment. Where much to my joy, I have seen this book being spread to all corners of the world in the meantime, and I've seen it being taken up by many uh, developing countries who have used these humanistic approach to city planning as an inspiration for their local city planning, which I'm very, very happy about. More and more editions came out and um, I got this picture from Hiroshima, the city architect of Hiroshima, proudly flashing the second version, second edition of the Japanese version of life between housing in this very, very somber place. The other thing here is a little other event in Sydney. They had some art interventions in the, in the alleyways and lo and behold, in one of them, there was a, 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 the, a, the, the roof of the room was covered with, uh, with neon lights. And actually, if you look closer, that was a barcode of life between buildings being used as a work of art in Sydney, just as example. Here, it's from Korea. It's from 1996. And this all this about how to create the human quality in the city. That was what I was talking about. But this picture shows that sometimes you are in time to change something. Sometimes you're definitely too late. 
it doesn't look like a very easy situation they have here. Now, in 19, 2021, I can realize that there's been 30 versions of the book Cities for People being, sorry, Life Between Buildings being pushed out. And I saw when I made this overview, much to my surprise, that out of 30 versions, 15 of these were pushed out inside the last 10 years. That means 40 years after the first version came out. And this shows that there is an accelerating interest and compassion for the life in the cities, for people in the cities, for the public space, and for understanding relationship between buildings and public space, which to me is very encouraging. We have a lot of what I call tailwind on the bicycle lane at, at, at the moment. As times go by, mindset has changed. Many years later, I was approached again by a Bay Media Foundation, which has really taken an interest in this a humanistic approach to city planning. And they came and said, couldn't you put down everything you know in one book while you can still remember it? And that was in 2009 or something. And then they say, how much many assistance would you need to do it? We know you're busy gave me the assistance and we produced Cities for People, which came out in 2010 and spread very, very quickly across the world. And it is supposed to be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Everything I ever knew or found out in all these years of studying and later on in all these years of practicing uh, my work in cities all over the world to help to cater for the people and the life in the cities. This book um, is by now out in 36 languages and four contracts is uh, uh, on the tracks and that has been done inside 10 years. And that to me shows that there is an enormous hunger for information about people and life in relation to, to, uh, to architecture and city planning. And it's, it's not only about how things look, but definitely how things work for people. Architecture is not to make a monument, to make an object. Architecture is the interplay between a form and the life. If there isn't this interplay between form and life. It's not architecture, it's sculpture. So we know a lot about form, but we know very little actually about life and the interaction of life and form. That is what these books are about. And that is maybe which shows why there has been such a hunger all over the world for this kind of information. In Denmark, we've seen it being used very much. We've seen Copenhagen, been inspired very much by this research done in School of Architecture. We've seen something like here, the Minister of Culture reading her favorite book. And she said, I read it in English so people can see what I'm interested in. But more importantly, she's changed the architecture policy to a new policy which puts people first in architecture and planning. Also, some royalty have been interested from time to time in these writings, and that, of course, is very encouraging. And other interesting things is that all these the cities which have done much for the life in the city, for the interaction between form and life, they are to be found on the lists of most livable cities again and again. Copenhagen and Melbourne generally are among the number one in the first five. This year took this year because Copenhagen was first that year and some other years, but it's been bobbing up and down between one and five. Melbourne is also very high and all the other cities have done remarkably well, especially the cities of Australia and New Zealand is just as much 
up on this line as are the cities of Scandinavia. Copenhagen is now quite famous for its livability, and we have the honor of receiving every year 400 delegations of mayors coming to hear what to do and see what has been done. This is a mayor from Sydney visiting Copenhagen. She was doing it during the climate conference, and we were standing here in one of the main streets or one of the side streets, and it was bloody cold, and she kept lamenting all this global warming, when can we expect it to start? That was a visit of the Sydney, but Sydney mayor, but she is still on and she's done remarkable things in Sydney to make it much more livable, to make the much better city for people. Also to my own great joy and pride, proud I was that when Copenhagen turned 850 years, there was a big festival where they named 10 guys and girls who have formed the city of Copenhagen as we know it. And lo and behold, among all the, the bishops and, and kings and Hans Christian Andersen or whatever, they selected number 10 should be me, who they say, you Jan, you're responsible for the way Copenhagen is today, today's Copenhagen. To have your, your face on the bus stops in your own lifetime, that is the highest you can get, at least in our society. I was very moved at that time. And more moved I was when my close associate Camilla was selected to be the new city architect of Copenhagen last year. So now Copenhagen is going on even more in full speed to be a good place for people. In the end of this presentation or this introduction, I'll tell you a little bit about the reflections. I've been around now for 60 some years in the profession and I've done a lot in a number of areas. And I've been teaching for 40 years. I've been giving endless many conference talks. I've been, been visiting professor here and there. I've done courses and post-graduation courses I have been, this, um, I have done uh, studies here and there and everywhere. And I've written, so, and I made many projects. After I studied for many years, the mayor started to come and grab my arm and say, you can criticize, but couldn't you come here and tell us what we shall do? That was the beginning of a long series where I started to be a consultant and had the glorious opportunity to take my research and put it into real life. It started in Copenhagen, of course, Berlin came in Oslo, Stockholm, and Perth, Australia, Melbourne, Australia, and then a lot of cities, London, Sydney, New York, Moscow, actually 200 cities I and my team have been addressing and, and, and being consultant for. In the meantime, there was so much work that I had to make a company, Gale Architects, which was started year 2000 when I was 63 years. So there's been many books and there are many projects and people have asked me what really was, what was the best thing you did in your life? And I'm absolutely sure that the best thing I did in my life, in my career has been to write the books, to put it down in writing to make it accessible also by donating my books to developing countries, to make it accessible across the world so that this research which is done in one corner of the world can be used in other corners of the world so that many people can have access to this research. So the best thing I ever do, did was writing the books while I was doing all the other things. By writing the books and making the research, you can change the mindset. And only when you've changed the mindset, you can start to change the cities. People must be able to understand why this shall be done. And they must be able to be inspired and enthusiastic about, of course, we will do it. We can achieve these and these qualities. Change the mindset, and then you can change the cities 
or do the projects. And here we are, the books. By now, there are 98 of them in 42 languages. And actually, there are seven titles, but 98 books. And then the remaining two until the 100 are coming in a short little while. The latest came a few days ago. That was the Arab version of the Arab version of Life Between Buildings coming just 50 years after the first one. So can architecture change the world? Yes, absolutely. We can change the world by being humble, by studying carefully and by spreading the word. If we have some words to spread and if they are good words. Thank you very much. That was the end of that. Well, thank you, Jan, uh, for the very inspiring <laughs> talk. Um, so we have people from all over the world tuned in, which is no surprise. And um, lots of compliments, all those things that you've heard over and over again about your books and your influences. And I got to say, it must be very gratifying to see these changes in your lifetime, the, the things, because I know in the early, we've talked about this in the early 60s and 70s, and probably still now, academia is not embracing any of these ideas. And you were an academic when you started. Certainly. And um, when I started this work, uh, st instead of looking at the form, I was looking at the life. Mm -hmm. All my good colleagues in School of Architecture, they lamented his thoughts, were sorry for me and said, Oh, you're wasting your, your career. You're, you're really into a dead, dead end street. Uh, it's, it's just, it's not part of architecture. But then I've seen more and more acceptance that life and form goes together when it's architecture and not sculpture. And that the study of life and the care for life is just as important as the care for form. We have to look into both. That has been increasingly accepted. And I think that after year 2000, we really have seen tailwind for this kind of humanistic approach. And as you, I showed you that especially that half of all life between building books are sent out in the last 10 years. Right. That's to me a fantastic uh, story. Also that it took 16 years before it came out in English. That's another story that thing, things take time. But I'm very fortunate to be old because being old, you have the chance to see what has happened with this and this and this. And you can go back and see the cities which have changed and see the people who have changed. And I meet quite many young people, but by now also rather old people saying, I'm studying city planning because I was in your course in 1982 or something like that. That is gratifying, I can assure you. It's just too bad that the academics all over the world have not embraced these ideas of public space and people and the life of people. Uh, because as you probably know, everywhere around the world, they're still architecture schools, especially, are still teaching form and really ignoring uh, people and the way people use spaces. And I think that's just, you know, we've talked about this. It's just very unfortunate that that's the case because we have this whole group of architects being trained um, not to think about people. I think you're completely right. And uh... I have another slide, which I don't took a, a long this time, but these kind of humanistic approach to architecture and city planning, which I think, of course, Jane Jacobs was the first really to raise that banner. And I also feel myself as being a disciple of that humanistic city planning. And it, when I look back at it, it's had a tremendous influence on the old cities where you have the spaces the only problem in the in London and New York and in Melbourne and Copenhagen was really that the cities had been overrun by traffic. And the trick was to chase the traffic out of the spaces 
and give the spaces back to the people and life could go on again. Yeah. But the influence on the new stuff, which was built um, after the Second World War based on, on modernism and motorism, there has been much less influence. Some years ago, we decided in our office to make a new book called Great New Towns of the 21st Centuries century and we started to collect material and in the end we found we had only we could only in, uh, allow some three four five to be in the book it was the thinnest book in the world and then we gave up the project realizing that while in the cities the citizens could understand this about life and people and the mayors and the politicians could understand because the citizens could understand that was ordinary people who could see there was something missing. But this same effect has not been prevailing in schools of architecture, I must also say. And we have many schools where they still say, everybody else teach about everything else, we teach about form. But that doesn't give good architecture necessarily. You have to have this combination of life and form and see it as a holistic thing. So, uh, Jan, there's, you know, there's several questions coming in, and I'm just going to try to group some of the questions together. One, one issue that we have, especially in American cities, is that you have the core of the, you know, the CBD, and then as you kind of move out, it dissipates, slowly fading into suburbia. You know, it's not, a, unlike European cities, which have a boundary, that this is the core and the boundaries then surrounded by agriculture. Here, all the agriculture is, you know, in most cases wiped out for suburbia. So is there any hope for those areas to actually create spaces? Uh, how do you see that edge condition actually being used or revised or changed? Yeah. First, I would point out that one of the reasons why Portland, Oregon has made some rather remarkable and interesting things is the fact that very early on, they defined, it, defined a, a growth line and say city will not grow beyond this line. We will have to densify, we'll have to improve what we have got. We cannot just go out and take another farmer's land and spread endlessly. Um, that of course has been a very good idea. Mm -hmm. I don't know too many good suburban projects, but I know one city where they have something interesting brewing, and that is Melbourne. Again, it is a city which has done miracles with their inner city. Right. And when they got bored of doing that, they started to think about what about the region, what about the metropolitan Melbourne. And it's all due to one guy, uh, the city architect, city director of urban design, Rob Adams. Um, and he has, uh, with his team, made this plan for the suburbs called uh, the um, Linea Barcelona. Uh, Melbourne is 3 million. They are going to expand to seven, 6 million. And he was able to prove that they could get all six, all three extra millions inside the city bounder. If they built more dense along the transport corridors in the suburbs. And he said, we never built more than seven stories because that's Barcelona. In Barcelona, everybody can see the ground and everybody is part of the ground. So nothing is higher than seven stories in Barcelona and in Paris, in the old Paris. Right. Um, and so that we keep it seven stories, but by doing densification onto seven stories along the transport corridors, they needed 13% of the suburban villas, but 87% of the suburban villas could be left there, and all of them will be in walking distance from public transportation, from services. So he saved the service, the suburbs. And he also, in this idea, gave room 
for a doubling of the population of the city. That is to me one of the very interesting schemes uh, nicknamed, nicknamed Linear Barcelona. Right, well thank you for sharing that because a lot of the questions people are always wondering about are these low density uh, areas all around the city. And of course I have to ask because there's so many questions about uh, post COVID and everyone's speculating on what the future is gonna be. And um, so I'm gonna let you speculate on one public, the use of public space and two transit because transit has taken a big hit during these, this past year. And uh, it's absolutely essential for what the kind of places that you and I have been talking about or trying to make. Uh, so what, what is the future of transit first and then public spaces? Yeah, you mentioned that uh, transit was um, had a bad time because of the COVID. Yes. Um, there's another thing which has had a good thing, good time because of the COVID, that's bicycling. Mm -hmm. And we've seen in many cities, they put up emergency bike lanes and used the fall in traffic generally to take out space to having more bike lanes. There are in, in Paris, in Rome and in Berlin, just to mention some cities where they rapidly expanded the bicycle system to accommodate that many more people during this epidemic are bicycling or starting to take on bicycling uh, so that bicycling is really on the uh, growing. Yes. Of course, the public transportation has suffered and that is very bad, of course, because we, we have to realize when we talk about the COVID that that's not the real problem today. The real problem for planning and architecture is sustainability. Mm -hmm. um, and that is, of course, for, to have a more sustainable city, we have to rig, we have to change our mobility systems into something which is much more sustainable, uses less resources, and where we can use our own energy, our legs much more. The doctors say that we have to do 10,000 steps a day to keep the doctor away. They say you can have seven more active years of life if you walk every day and if you make a city which really invites you to walk or bicycle. So they talk about the sitting syndrome that for 50 years we built cities which invited everybody to sit from early morning to late night and they say you have to do something else. And I can see all this going together. You can make a more livable city, a more sustainable city, a more healthy city, and a better city to be old in and young in, mm -hmm. if you look more after the people and not more after being able to use your own energy instead of using fossil or other types of energy. It's also more fun. Sure. So what about public space? Because there's a real misunderstanding going around that density should be avoided uh, because of this time of COVID. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, public, I mean, many places don't have the luxury of good public spaces. So, uh, you know, where do you see First, do you see people building more public spaces or defining more public spaces? And will they continue to be used? When I hear people talk about the COVID and the implications for architecture and planning, I would always say, look at history. Right. Because the human settlements throughout the centuries, there's been endless catastrophes there has been fires, there's been earthquakes and inundations, there's been one war after the other beleaguering of the cities, there's been the plague, there's been cholera, there's been tuberculosis, there's been the Spanish flu. And if we look at that history of, of, of settlements uh, for people, for human homo sapiens, we can see that every time 
the problem is over, we bounce back to being homo sapiens. So I say, don't look too much to a short period. Mm -hmm. We have almost forgotten the Spanish flu, which was a much worse pandemic yeah. um, 100 years ago. Yeah. And we cannot see it in our city plan, really. We overdid with the tuberculosis because that was the background for the modernists of spreading the cities and declaring the cities for dead. Um, and they've done enormously much harm to the cities um, in the name of being making healthy cities. They looked at one kind of health that was maybe the fresh air was good, right. but then they forgot about social parts of health, social relations, uh, contact with society, uh, being, uh, being able to experience the society you lived in, and all this uh, which, which creates good neighborhoods and good city districts. They did away with all this and say, if you can have grass, you cannot ask for more. Let's talk about zoning. You've always identified zoning as the biggest enemy of cities. That, of course, was um, exactly what the modernists came up with. But I'll tell you a funny story about modernism. In 1933, the major European urban planners met in Athens on a cruise ship mm -hmm. and signed the, the Athens Charter, the CIM, AM Charter of City Planning always separate housing, workplace, recreation, and communication. Always do this. In 1998, all the planners of Europe met again in Athens and they had produced a cruise ship for the event. And all of us signed the new charter of Athens in 65 years later, saying you must never ever separate housing, workplace, recreation, and communication, always keep people together. I remember speaking there, and the next guy, or the previous guy from speaking, uh, they, they asked 10 people to talk about each of the new 10 commitments for city planning. I remember that Leon Kria was before me or just after me. So that, that was really interesting times on a cruise ship. They negated everything which the other guys have propagated for 65 years ago. So um, just for the audience, we're coming close to the one hour point and uh, we still have a lot of questions. I'm not sure whether we're gonna be able to cover all the questions that we have, but what I wanna inform people who have a time constraint and have to leave at one o'clock that um, this, uh, event is being recorded and will be posted in the next day or two on CNE's website under on the park bench. So you can see all the past authors forums are being posted as well as all the on the park bench events. And we're going to continue talking because this is incredibly interesting. And if Jan, if you don't mind, we'll continue. Uh, and um, maybe for another half hour, if you feel like talking some more about some of these issues, and everyone else who has to go, uh, please do so and know that you can hear the uh, rest of the conversation uh, by going online. I think that half an hour is a very good time slot because <laughs> here we have dinner coming up. Oh, okay. <laughs> in Europe, it's, uh, it's seven o'clock and um, dinner has to be served in about half an hour. Okay. And I oh, have to be I have to be the cook, so well, you have to be the cook. Yeah. <laughs> I hope that we're not keeping you uh, from a hungry stomach. So, of course, of course not. Okay. Well, thank but you. I, I well, enjoy the conversation very much, also, Tiro. Okay. Well, me too. I, it's always a pleasure to talk to you and learn from you. Uh, so, one of the things you said way back um, in probably the first book was about activities and public space. And you defined three kinds, I'm paraphrasing, uh, activities that are necessary, activities that are optional, and activities that are social. Um, 
Has any of that changed? Have Homo sapiens changed in the last 50 years? Or are we still basically looking at those three activities in public space? Many times over the years when we published new editions of this book, yes. I was asked, now we are going to make a new edition. Mm -hmm. uh, what would you like to change? And then I read it carefully from cover to cover. And all the time, I almost came out with saying, no, I cannot add anything because it's about the relationship between Homo sapiens and his physical environment. And neither Homo sapiens or his relationship have changed in, in 50 years. So no changes. The only thing which has happened with this book is that the illustrations and the examples have been extended and exchanged because world look different now than right. it looked 50 years ago. Mm -hmm. And also I had to change a number of places where I wrote that can be seen in the brand new housing scheme there and there. Now I can say that can be seen in the quite famous housing scheme or in the, um, in the city plan, which we talk much about in the 80s, 1980s, whatever. Right. So these kind of changes there are, and it is updated. Okay. But, but I fully can stand for it as it is today, or as it is in the in the Arab version, which I got a few days ago. Yes. That is the newest one. Mm -hmm. Starts starts the wrong way. Yes. Mm -hmm. Right to left. I I I'm I checked the text and it's just about all right translated. Mm -hmm. <laughs> You have to trust these people. Yes. But I think that everybody which has worked on my books have been very careful in doing a proper job. So I rest assured that it's all right. Great. So uh, let's see. I've got, I'm looking at all these questions here. Let's let's talk about some of the developing countries in the world. And I know your books have been translated. Um, but you're always, you know, there's always this hesitation saying we are different or our conditions are different. And so this doesn't apply, you know, it can't apply to our, you know, when I have worked in places like India and China, we get that comment, oh, that works in the West, it doesn't work here. But one of the issues that I do see in my homeland is that any public space that you define is used by homeless people. And I find, you know, I, I think that's absolutely okay for people to sleep on park benches if they, if they need a place, but that seems to be an incredible deterrent to building public spaces. My, my first project was the retrofit of a master plan in India, and they had curb from building property line to building property line roadway. No sidewalks, no trees, because they were afraid of the homeless people uh, occupying those spaces. And if there was no trees and no sidewalks, a car could come and push, or a truck could come and push everyone away. Uh, you've said change the mindset, but how do you start to really change the mindset when people are so segregated by income? Yeah, I'm, I will um, skip this about income at this point and just say that I made several times the observation and expressed the viewpoint that this kind of humanistic city planning is especially mm -hmm. valuable and useful for developing countries because making good infrastructure for walking, for bicycling and for public transportation are some of the cheapest thing you can do in, in a society compared to infrastructure for buses and and metro lines and trains, it's much, much cheaper, not to speak of infrastructure for cars. Um, so that's very cheap. And I think that a very interesting example of using this uh, offensively in a social policy is from the work of, uh, of uh, Peñalosa in Bogota, 
where he had the notion that if this the economy of this rapidly growing South American city should be better, we must make it possible for the low income groups to be more mobile and to get those people who have no access to car to get them more mobile. We must have good sidewalks, good bike lanes, and we must have efficient bus rapid transit system so that you can bring people around in the city where they can find work, um, maybe not in their own favela, but they will have to travel to another district to find work. So by making the less privileged people more mobile, you can have a better economy. And also he said, you will have a better society and less crime because the, the parents will spend not so much time in a rattling bus, but they can come back to their children quickly and look after them. And he was also the one who said, the poorer you are, the more public space you need, or you sit in a little cottage, the whole family on top of each other and right. watch television. You should have possibility in poor areas, certainly to go out and find parks and playgrounds and streets where you can unfold. That was his policy and he has followed it rather interestingly in Bogota. Right. Well, I think that's a really good example. And thank you for bringing that up. Uh, and people who might not know about what's been happening in Bogota should definitely look that up because the embracing of the rapid bus system, it was one of the first places that chose rapid bus over metro lines because it was much cheaper and could be just as efficient. I also think that it's very important, uh, this idea that by by humanistic city planning policy, you can change the economy of the city in a positive way. Mm -hmm. um, and especially with focus on the poorer segments in the population. I think uh, to me, it's very logical because yeah. it's very cheap to do these things and everybody can use them and everybody will have a better opportunity. Also the rich people, mm -hmm. never mind how much, you drive in a car, you're always also a pedestrian at some point. You have to get out of the bloody thing. So uh, let's uh, get some more things. Um, what in your practice or your experience has not worked? You know, we, we all, I mean, you've had incredible success, but can we talk about something that was a misstep or misfiring, or were you always on track? Are you always what? On track. You always did. <laughs> I think generally, yes, there has been endless many successes mm -hmm. because actually it is very much based in studying how the old cities work for homo sapiens and how the cities were built by people for people. Then for a period modernism, motorism, we started to go in other directions. Right. And especially with motorism, we all worked to make the cars happy and not the people. And by studying how people was happy in the older days, we have a very secure ground to build from. And when we repeat these, basic qualities which are closely related to the human body, the human senses, the human abilities to move and whatever, then we actually are on quite safe ground. And that is why uh, there's been many places where these things have been a great success, these transformations. Maybe I could mention Moscow because in Moscow, when we started working there, it was completely inundated by motor cars. Right. Um, after the fall of the Soviet Union and this whole change of economy, everybody rushed out to try to buy a car. That was the freedom from communism was to own a car and park it anywhere, which they did. It was completely silly. And then we were asked to come up with plans to make Moscow a better place for the people. It used to be a nice place, 
but then that was all gone. And we had to widen the sidewalks and take the car parking off the sidewalks. We have to narrow the streets. We have to regulate the parking. A number of things which were very, very uh, unpleasant. And was there was quite a cry of terrorism and whatever we, we, we were doing for a while. And then we started to see a new movement of people saying, hey, it's actually a better city. We, 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 we have more opportunities now. And in the end, they accused me of being responsible for the new Moscow baby boom, because now they can use the boulevards, they can sit on the benches, and the parks were not full of, par of park cars anymore. And life has started to unfold again. Baby boom. I'm proud of that one. <laughs> That's great. Well, I've, I've had the pleasure of walking on some of those streets in Moscow uh, almost eight years apart. And it's amazing what has happened to that city. Uh, and uh, they have a very strong will to get that done. And I think that's- They have a very efficient democracy. Yes, that's a good way of putting it. Maybe I should tell one more thing. I always thought that maybe all this was done for the benefit of, of human beings, mm -hmm. for the betterment, for, for the living environments of man. Then I realized that they were preparing the city for the uh, soccer championship. Uh -huh. um, and they just, we just finished in time for all the guests to go to Moscow and see a nice city. But never mind, many cities have improved very much because of an Olympic game or because of a, of a Commonwealth game or being cultural city of Europe or whatever. So that's fair enough. But whenever we have better conditions for people, that's great. We all, that's for all of us at all times and all economies, all religions, everything. It's for everybody and it's very cheap. Well, Jan, I wanna let you know that, you know, again, I'm looking at this list and there's people from Egypt, India, uh, Athens, Canada, Sweden, Bangladesh, Ireland, uh, it's endless. So uh, Mexico, uh, so, uh, so you know, there's a lot of people interested in what you what you have been saying and learning from you. Uh, let's talk about the uh, your big five cities. I know you worked <laughs> <laughs> you worked in some of the major cities, uh, but is that what you did in the major cities uh, applicable? You know, do they have the same resources to apply them to smaller smaller cities? Of course, I've been discussing this many times. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think one of the best uh, cities I know is a small little college, a little, little uh, village on a Danish island, mm -hmm. small Danish island. There are 400 people living on the island and they have one little village and they have a main street, which is the most amazing public space I know. Because if you go up and down that little piece of Main Street between the store and the church, you know everything about that society. People are talking to each other. They are looking at each other. So wherever there is homo sapiens, we can apply the same medicine roughly because we have the same aspirations, the same senses and um, there are so many things, the same joys of meeting other people, whatever. So there are so many things which are the same, whether it's a big city or a small city, whether it's a rich city or a poor city. Um, and interestingly, we of course, we know now that it's the same species of mm -hmm. homo sapiens who live in all corners of the world. Right. And I have been amazed myself by studying in Japan and in South Africa, in Australia and in Greenland. Um, just to mention some extremes, also, yeah, in, in Arab countries, whatever, to find the enormous amount of shared 
behavior we have because we have the same biological history. We right. have the same apparatus. We are the same species. So if there are people living in these places you mentioned, if they are species, homo sapiens, <laughs> you can use the same tools more or less. Of course, some places are very hot. Some places are very cold. Some places are very hilly. Um, and there are a number of environmental circumstances which influence the life in the various places. Also, there are cultural circumstances, but still with the cultural circumstances, I could see working in Middle East Arab countries that the same behavior basically as you saw in Japan or in, in Africa or in Greenland, which is very interesting. And you said that um, one of the most interesting things for people is looking at other people. So everywhere you are in the world, uh, that was, that's what interests us the most, is observing other people. And public, public places are the best place to do that. <coughs> so. There is an old saying we found in a Icelandic saga, which is 900 years old, there was a guy saying, man is, ma is man's greatest joy. Mm -hmm. And we have endless many uh, studies showing that, um, that we are very interested in life and people throughout our lives. It, it, public life is one part, but the small children in a flat will be very, very interested in what the grown-ups are doing. They will gather in the living room, in the studio, in the kitchen. And every time the day is over, you have to take all the placings back to the children's room and it will be out again next day because they will play where the grown-ups are. We know from housing areas how the children again are supposed to be in the park, but they are not in the park, they're in the parking lot because more things are happening in the parking lot. We know from, from studies of cities, how benches where you have a good look to other people, if you have, can see trees and birds and water and people at the same time, that's number one. But if you can only see flowers and the other one only people, you will find that the people bench is more used. We have many recordings from elderly, from old people's home and places for elderly, that the elderly people are just as interested in life as are the children. Right. I have a sister who is unfortunately in an old people's home. Mm -hmm. And she tell me, can you see out there, there is a past. And sometimes, sometimes there are some people walking by, that's very interesting. That is very interesting. That sure. gives variation, that gives a little bit to think about, that gives the feeling that you are part of a society, of a neighborhood. It may be very slow pace of life, right. but it is life. Terrific. Um, so I think one, one aspect of what you're saying uh, reminds me that, you know, urban is, uh, urban is not always a good word. People are afraid of urban life because of the crime and, and you know, they say, we much rather be in a village or a small town. But no matter where you are in the spectrum of small town, village, city, whatever, hamlet, there's always a moment of urbanism in those places. There's one, some place where people gather the crossroads or some little element uh, spatially where everyone congregates or runs into each other. So there's that kind of, mo there is that moment, even if you are in a place with 400 people, as you just said, uh, that has those commonalities of urban life. And connects people across the households right. to community. Yes. It gives you the feeling of being part of something greater than your own being or your household, which is very important. Mm -hmm. um, I had, I mentioned that very early in my life, I was working for a client who wanted something which is good for people. Yes. I have not, I have rather recently met another guy, just the same type, 
saying, I have this wonderful piece of land, but it should be good for people. What shall we do? And there we have defined good for people is that it's just as good inside as it is outside. That means you should put as much energy into making the dwellings and, and making the bathrooms and the kitchen with everything, and just as much effort into making wonderful semi-private places just around the building and then uh, transition zones to more public and good quality of planting and of, of, of uh, paving and whatever, so that they are as much inclined to spend some time outside, to walk more and to bicycle more and spend more time in their front yards and whatever. That is, that is how we defined good for people, good, uh, just as good outside as inside. Normally, we as architects do much more effort inside. Right. And then outside is what is left of the budget. The landscape architect can have a heyday with what is left. Yeah, I'm just uh, going through these notes. So I, I'm going to just read you a question um, about you know incorporating uh, high density towers. I know you and I share this uh, idea that everything should be low scale or human accessible by human power. And you can walk up six floors, at the, I think six or seven floors at the maximum. Uh, four is more ideal. Yeah. But how do you deal with this issue of super density <clears throat> and uh, the fixation on building high rise buildings? Uh, as you know, people saying that that is the only solution to accommodate this burgeoning population that we have doing it. I certainly can understand this, but I still think it's a quick answer to a complex question. Mm -hmm. And whenever I hear people ask for high density, I will say, what is wrong about Paris? Right. What is wrong about Barcelona? They have a terrific density. They have very nice public spaces. They have balconies, they have courtyards, whatever. I know that it takes much more architects work to make a good settlement, which is not enormous. It's very easy to make a tower for God's sake. Mm -hmm. it, if you take the tower and make it, make it horizontal, you have to work much harder so that people are not looking into each other's windows and all that stuff. But on the other hand, they are close to each other. They're close to the ground. They're part of the city. I always would say, and, and of course, this is based on studies. We have done all these studies where we have students going up in high rise and then telling when they are not in part of the world anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, and we found that after the fifth floor is a very important threshold where you stop being part of the city and the world and start to be part of the airline system <laughs> or bird system. Yeah. Because you cannot see, you cannot see anything uh, just by a glance out of the window. You can see a sky going by or a helicopter going by. You cannot see any people and not see any life, no sign of being in the city. That could be for some people a benefit, but for other people, we know a lot about that. The higher you are, the more complicated it is to get down and out, and the less the children come out, the less the grown ups come out. We talk about psychological barriers and we talk about physical bar barriers. And we know all this is well, is well researched. And I know still that there are a number of places like. Hong Kong or other places with incredibly little space. Singapore is another one where you are forced to build higher buildings. Right. And, uh, and in some places you can do this like in Singapore where they have uh, very little crime. Um, in other places when you build high rise, you have enormously concentration of crime in and around these places. 
because they are not so social as uh, as the, the street uh, and the low rise development. Um, but of course, you have to do it, and then it you have really have to work very hard with where you come out of the place and how it lands in the city. And you can see there are quite many, when you see good high rise, they always land in a very friendly way and start to talk to the surroundings. Well, the best example I know is what we call the Vancouver plateau system. Yes. That means <laughs> that, 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 that you, you can make a city, a wonderful city of four or five stories, and then you can put some high stuff in the middle of the block um, for those who like airlines. But then you have a fine city, and then you have also an increased density and some people who like airlines. I so, think that's a good way of addressing it. Look at how you land in the city and be, be careful and actually love the city and do some good things for the city. Mm -hmm. When you, even if you, when you build high rise, don't let them go into the ground like a Norwegian mountain going into a fjord. Well, you know, a couple, the very first um, authors forum that we did was with Steve Peterson and Barbara Littenberg about their book Space Anti-Space, which really addresses a lot of the issues that you are talking about. But one of the things that they pointed out was that the early buildings in Lower Manhattan were all towers that were engaged with smaller buildings. So you, they were composites. And the high rise did not just be a freestanding object, which is what it's you know, come out to be now, but really the buildings like the Singer building and city hall buildings, the early buildings in Lower Manhattan, all were engaged. So you did have a high piece, but you also had this humanistic scale that might fill the block uh, and the building was buried, which I think is much harder to do as an architect because you've got different services coming down, but a much more humane way of dealing with those towers in the city. Uh, I think it's important to realize that to do a good job, you have to work hard. You work, have to work harder than what is normally done, because we see many sing, uh, many easy solutions. Okay. If he wants so many square meters, he can have a tower and he can go straight into the ground. So what? And, but then we need the architect to be the advocate and say, hey guy, you have to, we have to have more resources to work this out in a proper way so that we add to the city and don't distract from the city. Uh, one of my good colleagues in School of Architecture, he always said, always ask what your building can do for the city instead of asking what your city can do for your building. He, I think he picked it up somewhere, but he was a good sentence. <laughs> it's a good transformation or a good analogy. There's another good one that is, of course, and this is a, a, a stealing from Churchill that first we form the cities and then the cities form us. That was originally Churchill uh, addressing a question about the House of Parliament had been hit by German bombs and yeah. were going to be rebuilt. Mm -hmm. And the architects say, Mr. Churchill, shouldn't we add the extra seats we are short of because it's always too small and then he said, no, don't change the house because we form the house and then the form, the house forms us. That is that that sentence has been elaborated into that other yeah. sentence, which yeah. is absolutely true. Both mm -hmm. the city forms you and the building forms you. Absolutely. Um, you're very right. Uh, I don't want to keep you from your dinner. This has been really delightful, Jan. Uh, we could go on for many, many more, uh, you know, um, and it's, I really appreciate your friendship and your willingness to do this. Uh, and I hope we have this opportunity again. Is there any, uh, anything, last words that you want to say to the next generation of architects and planners coming up? I know 
uh, you've talked about people, but is there any? Oh, oh yeah, I could find one. Bergeni will be a quotation. But first, I will send a greeting to Rob Stowell. Stowell, yeah. um, Is that how you pronounce it? Stowell, yeah. yeah. I really enjoy your, your magazine, uh, Public Spaces, which you send around with, with frequent intervals. It's, I think it's enjoyable and there's much good stuff to be gotten from that. Thank you for that. But to answer your question, I will quote my good friend, Ralph Erskine. Mm -hmm. While all the modernists were doing all their stuff, Ralph Erskine, he kept having the ability to do the big scale, the medium scale, right down to the small scale. So when he left an area, it was just a wonderful place to live, but also you had the cheap housing or whatever you were asked to be. He, he worked all the way until the landscape for people was very perfect. When Ralph Eskin was very old, we made an interview in the television with him and we asked, what, dear Ralph, could you tell me, what is it that makes a good architect? And he said, oh, good architect, that's simple. To be a good architect, you must love people. Because being an architect, you have to form the frames of people's life. And to do that properly, you must love the people you work for. Thank End you. of quote. <laughs> end of also I finished my book Cities for People with that sentence because to me that was very very strong we must take an interest in the people we work for sure. and yeah. we must know more about people in the school of architecture we must know about life we must be human that's right uh, great well again thank you so much Jan it's been really been a pleasure, and Rob and the CNU for behind the scenes, taking care of all the details. And uh, remind everyone, if you've missed any of this or your friends have missed it, uh, go on to the CNU website, uh, go to resources on, on the park bench, and uh, you can see a lot of these conversations, including this one. Rob, I guess will be posted in a day or two. Is that the timeline? Uh, hopefully we'll get it tomorrow, maybe okay. the next day. Great. So thank you. And to all our visitors from all over the world, thank you for joining us. This has been terrific. Uh, I'm so glad to see people from every part of the world uh, as part of this conversation. And um, one more reminder, CNU, the Congress 29 is going to be in a couple of weeks uh, and you can register. Uh, and there's three days of conversations on uh, social issues, equity, the physical environment, um, and a lot of advice for just about anyone who's interested uh, in the built environment and how to improve it. So thank you. And thank you, Jan. You're thank most you welcome. Again. Greetings to everyone. Goodbye from Copenhagen. Thank you. Good night.